Thank you so much. And hi, everybody. It is so nice to be here. Is it nice for you to be here? Yeah, first time in, first time in two years. Um, and welcome to all the people who are joining hybridly, virtually as well. Um, that's actually one of the silver linings, perhaps, that has come out of this experience we've had over the last two years is um, really taking advantage of technology to, uh, to open the opportunities for people to join events like this, even if they can't travel to DC. Um, and maybe next year they'll come in person or maybe not, but it expands the circle and we can reach more people. So um, I don't know about your workplaces, but we're in a major transition at EPA, um, uh, providing opportunities to, 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 to be co collegial more with more people, um, and also to cram more meetings in the day. Are you guys doing that too? There's, there's like no passing periods anymore. Um, very bad for the kidneys. So um, uh, it, it's especially great for me to be here at this particular conference. Um, I think few things epitomize uh, the best about the commitment in this country to address the crisis that is the climate crisis than this particular organization. I'm so proud of EPA's support, um, but, but also of all of you who have come together, big, small, coastal, Midwestern, Southern, Northern, from all aspects of American, the American economy um, and uh, motivated by a singular interest in taking responsibility and doing what we know we must do in order to um, to preserve um, the planet uh, for every, every living thing on it and the non-living things too. Um, so thank you, and thank you to C2ES, thanks to the Climate Re Registry and everybody who put this program together, because um, that, that takes a lot. Um, I'm thrilled to be, uh, um, not literally here at this moment, but I will be followed by uh, my colleague in the federal government, um, Andrew Mayock, who is one of the, just the superstars of getting things done um, and helping to transform the federal government um, into uh, an ever more effective engine of change um, to support the work all of you do um, and to be partners in together getting to where we need to go. So um, uh, I am here to talk about what's going on at EPA um, right now, um, uh, and, and you will know that um, we have in the, the president and the administrator uh, no two more um, emphatic leaders uh, that this work is important for us to do. Um, I, I do just need to take a minute before I get down to business um, to, to just recognize what happened in this country yesterday. I knew I was, this was going to happen, um, but it should happen, right? Um, this should choke us all up. Um, unacceptable, more and more violence in our country. Um, I know that we all held our children and our grandchildren a little tighter. Last night, um, my daughter is a school teacher in Boston, and I think about her every day. Um, there are families that will never be the same, never, ever be the same. Um, uh, and it happens just way too often in this country. Um, re reading President Biden's words last night, um, just, um, he just, he goes to the essence every single time. Um, and uh, what, he, what he said last night is that um, it is time to turn this pain into action. Um, and um, I, I know you all feel that way too. So um, it is hard to turn our attention to regular work when these kinds of things are going on in our country, um, but we, we will um, because this is critical work um, and we're all about protecting public health and the environment um, and have the opportunity to do so. So let me just um, uh, say once and twice and three times uh, that EPA and the Biden administration have made confronting the climate crisis an absolute top priority. President Biden um, uh, walked the walk the minute he came into office with um, a series of executive orders that made very clear how important climate change was for, um, by golly, this administration to, uh, to make some changes in. So we at EPA, um, as um, we were during the Obama administration when I had the honor to be at EPA also, um, we are a thousand percent in and committed to doing our part uh, to make progress at this moment, 
right now at this moment with the support of this president. Um, and, to, and to be mindful of all of the other important priorities that the president has put forward. Um, uh, protecting and increasing good paying jobs in this country, revitalizing our communities, building resilience into our communities, um, making sure that people who have been left behind in this country are left behind no longer. And we can do all of these things because they are all of a piece of uh, preserving and protecting and strengthening the resilience of this country. But let me focus on the climate crisis. Um, uh, I'm sure you've already heard from many speakers um, and don't have to tell you that the climate crisis is ever more present um, every day in, in, in this world. Um, and uh, I'll just go through a few um, uh, aspects of this that um, uh, are on my mind all the time. Um, uh, changes in weather, in frequency and ferocity of storms, uh, destroying homes, schools, and businesses on a regular basis, costing the, Ameri the American economy um, billions of dollars, $100 billion last year alone. Um, in New England, where I just was earlier this week, um, we're seeing changes in heavy rainfall frequency. In fact, um, uh, shockingly um, high um, numbers in terms of increased rainfall in New England. Um, sea level rise, obviously, a, a, a super big concern in the, in the Northeast given their topography. Um, in the Midwest, um, where my home is in Indiana, historic floods, windstorms, and droughts, um, devastating farming communities, drenching neighborhoods, businesses, and manufacturing, knocking out hospitals for months at a time, um, significant risk and cost to public health and to economic well-being and to people's sense of, of security and comfort in living in, in communities that have been so stable and, um, and, and, and relatively easy for so long. No longer, no longer. Um, in Alaska, whole villages are being declared as lost to climate change. How can that be um, as barrier islands are exposed um, to the, the fall storms used to have sea ice that would come in and protect them. They don't have that anymore. So these barrier islands where people have lived for generations and generations in conditions that, that, that I myself would probably not last a week in, um, and, uh, and, and then those communities are being lost forever, um, and folks are having to rethink how they live their lives. There's no small town, big city, or rural community across the country that, or in the world that is unaffected by this crisis. Um, truly global, societal, um, with, with fingers that extends beyond the obvious things. Um, it exacerbates and amplifies other global challenges and domestic challenges, poverty, hunger, global health, political instability, the movement of people across physical and political boundaries, um, instability, um, and, and that's, that's sort of the top of the list, right? Um, we all know this. Um, we also know that the effects of these um, impacts are, are not equally distributed, um, even in this country and certainly around the world. Um, black and African American individuals are projected to face higher risks for many types of climate change impacts. They are more likely to live in neighborhoods with fewer trees and more heat trapping pavement. Um, heat is the leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States. Maybe not as dramatic as hurricanes and tornadoes, um, but overall more people um, affected by heat than any other um, weather-related incident. Um, the, and in fact, the, the rate of heat-related deaths is 150 to 200% greater for black and Afri African Americans um, than it is for non-Hispanic whites. Um, American Indian individuals, 48% more likely to live in areas where the highest percentage of land is projected to be inundated by increasing um, floods. So uh, we know that these inequities are rooted in generational issues of systemic environmental racism and, and classism, and more people are talking about that now, which is vitally important. And this president, this administrator, this EPA, we're committed to doing our part to uh, addressing these generational wrongs. 
President Biden has called for a whole-of-government approach to advancing equity and justice across all of our activities in the executive branch. As one of his first actions in January 2021, he signed an executive order that pledged to prioritize environmental justice and to advance a systematic approach to racial justice, civil rights, and equal opportunity. And our administrator, Michael Regan, has committed to making environmental justice underpin all of our work and to baking environmental justice and the sense of equity into all the work that we do at EPA. And he has walked the walk, uh, literally has walked the walk. He has had the honor of visiting communities in Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Houston, and many, many other places in the country on what is, has been uh, named his journey to justice. He spent time with people in their homes, in their churches, in their schools, on their playgrounds, listening to their frustration, listening to their pain, listening to stories about family members and neighbors who've been stricken with illness from breathing polluted air and drinking contaminated water, seeing raw sewage in people's front yards that's not the result of a sewer line break. It's what they live with every single day. This is not what we should see in neighborhoods and homes across this country. These communities are predominantly black and Latinx, and they've been living on the front line of pollution for generations. They are also suffering the impacts of climate change um, to a greater degree. And they have been pleading for action for decades. And now is the time for this administration, this EPA, to start responding to those concerns with increased attention to environmental justice in all of our programs. And we're working with our state, local, and tribal partners all along the way, and with local businesses, um, uh, national corporations, anybody who is willing to recognize and do the work um, to address these issues. We want to make sure that communities have the tools that they need to address their issues, to identify what matters to them. They live in these communities. They know what the issues are. They know what's most important to them in a way that the federal government never could. So, for example, uh, Administrator Regan in March announced that 99 overburdened communities from across the country would be receiving each up to $75,000 in grant funding. That may not seem like a lot of money, um, but uh, I've, I've done this work in my home state, and I know how far a small grant like that can go to really make a difference in a community, and not only to, to, to make a difference on the ground, but to make them feel valued and respected and included in the, the, the forward movement of, of this country. One example, I was recently in Cincinnati, and there's an incredible organization called Groundwork Ohio River Valley who was bringing in high school and middle school students to learn how to run purple air monitors, which are these nifty little portable air quality monitors so that they could spread them around their community in Cincinnati and get a sense of what the micro environments were in their community. So many advantages to programs like this and there are groups all over the country that want to step up and have those opportunities. So we are doing what we can to make sure that we're helping to find the areas where capacity needs to be built and, and providing the resources, the training, the, the support, the connections, um, and um, when we have it, uh, the, the funds um, to, to, to make those kinds of things happen, to help change systems and structures in ways that, will, um, that don't depend on the federal government into the future, but will make permanent change in, in those communities. So let me, let me talk about another huge opportunity um, that we're taking advantage of and are, are implementing with, uh, with um, every uh, goodwill, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law. Massive, massive opportunity. So how many people in the room, audience participation, um, were born after the Eisenhower administration? <laughs> okay, so pretty much everybody. That's the last time this country invested in our infrastructure in the way this administration and this Congress has invested uh, when we built out the national uh, interstate highway system. That's a long time, um, and this is an incredible opportunity. I'm so proud that EPA is one of the, the, the five or six agencies that are, that are 
carrying the load of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. EPA um, is, is managing, is handling $60 billion over five years. If you think about our annual budget, is about nine and a half billion dollars. So this is like doubling EPA's budget for each of the next five years. 50 billion of that will go through the state revolving fund program for drinking water and clean water, stormwater infrastructure improvements, which will be done in a way that is climate resilient, um, is climate mitigative, if that's a phrase, um, is going to pay attention to communities that have not had access to these kinds of resources before, is going to take care of as many of those communities where there is untreated sewage on a daily basis in people's yards as we possibly can. Um, we are all in on that. Um, but so exciting that there are other opportunities um, through the infrastructure bill too. Um, the Superfund program, the, there's, there's hundreds of sites all across the country, right? Many of them are ready to go. They are ready to put shovels in the ground, but for the funding. And now hundreds of them will have it through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Hundreds of brownfields programs, which are, you know, there are few things that are more productive and positive in a community than cleaning up a brownfield program. And you can provide job training, opportunities for people right there. These are not jobs that can be outsourced. Um, and then you have productive property that can be redeveloped and, um, and used by the community. Um, uh, one of the uh, programs that's so dear and near and dear to my heart is cleaning up the, the nation's school bus program. Um, that there, I, I think it's on the order of 300,000 buses, school buses around the country. I may be off by 100,000 or so. Um, there's lots. Uh, 25 million kids ride the school bus to, to school um, every day, which actually seems like a low number. Doesn't that seem low? I'll have to check that. It's, it seems low to me. Anyway, um, uh, a lot of them still ride on the stinky, smoky diesel bus that we all rode on. Um, 40, 50, however many years ago. Um, we don't need to have that anymore. Um, there is technology, there are American manufacturers making electric school buses. Let's get kids on those school buses and then when you stand behind the bus um, and you're worried about the smoke coming out of the tailpipe, you don't have to because there's no tailpipe. No tailpipe on these buses. Um, and people love them, so, so let's do that. And we have, through the um, infrastructure bill, a billion dollars to help fund this and to jumpstart the manufacturing here in this country so that, um, so that uh, every kid can ride an electric bus to school. Um, in terms of EPA um, has a big regulatory agenda, as you all know, um, and that's the part of the, the program that I came out of. Um, we hit the ground running um, with our clean cars rule, um, uh, which is um, just massively important, the strongest uh, um, uh, tailpipe standards um, ever passed in this country. Um, we hit the ground running with hydrofluorocarbons under the AIM Act. Um, another kind of a little bit of a sleeper program. A lot of people don't really, they look at cars and they look at power plants and they look at smokestacks. Um, but, but HFCs are massively impactful from a climate um, perspective and, uh, and through the Kigali Amendment um, and the efforts of a, a lot of American corporations and innovation, um, hugely impactful. Our, our, um, uh, the, the AIM Act rules implementing that is expected to reduce more than four and a half billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2050, um, th th which is equivalent to about three years of U.S power sector emissions based on 2019 uh, numbers. So, so you, you, can, you can make a big difference with, with that kind of a rule. Um, we are, um, have a proposal out for, for methane emissions from oil and gas operations. Again, this is the next iteration um, after the rule that the Obama administration passed. Technology has advanced. Um, more companies are more understanding of the impacts that their industry is creating and that they need to, to do something. Um, another um, key area for us that we're working on is, um, is our clean trucks plan. Um, uh, transportation, as you know, contributes about a third of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but trucks, like school buses, 
emit a lot of NOx and particulate matter right in our community. So anything we can do to clean those up is going to have an immediate impact um, on, on people's asthma, um, on heart disease, um, on premature mortality right in our, in our communities. Um, so um, uh, stay tuned um, for lots of action on that. We are also um, working on the next iteration of expectations for the power sector, um, and you will, you will see that coming um, in, in the coming months. Uh, we know that these rules um, are not inimical to a healthy economy. Um, they are uh, necessary to a healthy economy. Um, and we are committed to working with you at our, and all stakeholders to make sure that those rules are based on, on facts, are based on expertise from the industry, no good passing a rule that the industry cannot comply with. Um, I've done this too long, to, um, and, and I know that's so. Um, and also no use passing a rule that doesn't comply with our underlying statutory authorizations. Um, so we're going to make sure that, uh, that both of those happen. Um, Administrator Regan has made clear that he is looking comprehensively um, across the way we uh, implement our regulatory programs. Um, and we're also focused um, significantly on the non-regulatory side of both carbon mitigation um, and uh, climate resilience. Um, I, I want to I wanna, um, finish by um, talking about partnerships. Um, I was so thrilled when I was at EPA before to learn about um, the significant investment of time and resources that EPA has put into developing partnership programs over, over the years. They are a necessary complement to regulatory activity, and in fact, um, they, they the partnership programs and the leadership programs that EPA has helped to, to support and participate with, um, uh, in my view, um, have contributed greatly to the ambition that our regulatory programs can, ha can have. Because at, 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 in the AIR program, for sure, um, we, don't, we, we don't make up technologies. You know, we don't imagine the jetsons of, of, of technology that doesn't exist yet. Um, the Clean Air Act says, look around and who's doing the best out there? And let's write rules to make sure that everybody does the best. And then we'll come back again and do it again. And who's doing the best? People like the people in this room. And you, you, you create that leading edge that sets the example for our rules to set the ambition on. So, um, so thank you um, for your, all your participation in those kinds of partnership programs. The Office of Air and Radiation at EPA has more than a dozen climate partnership programs encompassing tens of thousands of organizations. 40% of Fortune 500 companies, um, and I hope, I hope most, if not all of you here today, who are thinking about how to advance energy efficiency, clean energy, setting examples in your industry and in your communities and in your states. Yes, we can do this as corporate America. It is good for business. It is good for our local communities, um, and it represents the best of what America wants to be, which is thinking beyond ourselves, thinking for the future, and using the, the resources and the opportunities we are fortunate enough to have in this wealthiest of countries and most innovative of countries to make the progress and lead the way and set, and set the example. Um, our climate, climate uh, partnership programs have prevented more than six billion metric tons of GHGs um, over the years and helped American consumers and businesses save more than $500 billion. Um, those are pretty impressive numbers. Um, and, and in terms of the, the percentage of, uh, of reductions compared to the inventory that we're looking at, in 2019 alone, the emissions reductions were uh, equivalent to about 8% of all of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, again, that's a pretty big chunk um, out of um, a, a pool that is uh, made up of so many different sources. So um, I know you are going to go on to do even better things, 8.5%, 9%, 10%. Uh, let's have an auction. Um, so I, we, we have a historic opportunity ahead of us here. Um, I think we're coming out of this two-year um, uh, awful 
period of time um, with renewed energy um, to be together, to share ideas, but really more to make a difference. Every day that goes by, we understand the urgency more and we also see the opportunities more. Um, I love groups like this because you all need to support one another. Uh, you need friends, you need colleagues, you need people to steal ideas from. I hope you're gonna steal at least one idea while, while you're here. Um, uh, and, and, and take it home um, and put it to work. Um, thank you for everything that you do. Um, we look forward to continued partnership with you. Um, you should, you know, we are easy to find. So find us if you've got an idea or you wanna talk about something. Um, please participate in the regulatory process. Uh, we need comments from everybody. That builds the record on which we build sound and workable and defendable rules. So um, uh, I used to run around Indiana talking to people about climate change and people would always say at the end, well, what can we do? What can we do? I know that's, that's the instinct. So those are some things that you can do. Um, keep these partnerships going, participate in our process. Um, don't let a good idea um, sit in the back of your mind. Um, put it down, send it to us, send us, a, send us an email. That's all we do, that's all I do anyway, all day is email. Um, <laughs> So um, with a group like this, you know, I'm optimistic for the future. Have to be, we have to be, right? So let's do it, let's do it together, let's do it fast, let's do it well, um, and let's feel, feel good about it. So thank you again for having me, and I hope that to, to run into you all at some point in the future.